Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Immutable Mindset. Today, we have a special guest joining us, a true pioneer in the tech and digital marketing world who's been at the forefront of innovation since the mid-90s, from bro brokering banner ads for Yahoo as a teenager to opening up one of the first digital marketing agencies in the country, F5 Consulting Group, with his first client being none other than the aforementioned Yahoo. He's worked with some of the biggest Web2 brands in the world, including Nike, Disney, and Red Bull, and has had just enough cool in his resume, from handling the marketing for Kobe Bryant's sneaker collection at Nike, to starting a private food delivery company and selling it to Grubhub. Entry and exit. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Charles has been a constant trailblazer in the tech world and has been involved in the crypto space since 2014. He's consulted with some of the biggest players in Web3, like Polygon, Dapper Labs, Cardano, Chainlink, and, Coin and Cointelegraph. And now he's taking on a new challenge as the global lead of business development for Aptos, a layer one blockchain. So please, let's give a warm welcome to Charles Atkins, the former VP of NFTs at Polygon and former VP of strategy at Land Vault, and the man who was an OG crypto kitty before you knew what NFTs were. It's going to be an epic ride, folks. So let's get started. Charles, welcome to the Immutable Mindset. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's good to be here. Good to talk to both of you guys. Hey, Charles, awesome. what's happening, man? Yes, it's an absolute pleasure. Charles, I, uh, I have to say, I have been following you on, on Twitter. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I thought I had a plan for this show. I thought I had a good idea as to kind of your background. You know, I did the recruiter thing, looked at your LinkedIn, and had this idea in my head. And, uh, and had to do a little bit of this, and then a little bit of that, which is throwing the script away. And I had to start afresh because I, had, I pressed play on the tape and I heard you start speaking and you are absolutely a technological and digital marketing trailblazer. And I want to dive right in there and start during those Yahoo banner ad days, yeah. you know, which, which by the way is, is super cool and super interesting because I, I personally can picture that because I'm just that old, uh, thinking right. back to that time. You know, I, I think about those early technologies and since we are OG users of the web, and what I thought about them and, and you know, thinking about the, the search engines we use, like like Alta Vista, Netscape, social media, like Friendster and MySpace, You're having to learn like us here, man. having to learn. I know. Right. Did, did everybody else have to learn HTML and CSS to, to code your MySpace and make it the best thing ever? You know, online marketplaces like Amazon, eBay, Etsy. My question is, what were your early thoughts about Web2 technology and interacting with them since you were right there in in the cusp of it? I mean, my early thoughts was, you know, kind of back at, like you were saying, even before um, really like the web to, you know, especially social kind of take took off. I mean, we were back on ICP and all of those other, you know, little chat messengers we used to use all the time. But, you know, at the time we were just hoping for like faster internet because, you know, we're on these like 28K, 56K modems, like <laughs> slower than that. And what really you know, it was great. You can like chat with each other, but when it came to multimedia, when it came to like, Hey, I want to give you a visualization of this tough. I mean, you, you wait like three to five minutes for like a <laughs> one megabyte photo to, to download. And then all of a sudden high speed internet comes, comes out and you're like, Whoa, like we can watch video. We can listen to sound. We can put My music. Porn is so much faster. And then, <laughs> and then that's when like the, one of the biggest trends that I hated so much, everybody started putting music on their website. You go to their website. It's just like immediately music auto play playing. in your ear. Yeah. And, and that was one of the worst I'm sorry. things that could have possibly happened. Uh, so I, I mean, for me, I, I loved the application layer, but I was always so interested in like, wow, this like underlying infrastructure of this is getting so much faster so much quicker than I ever expected. And that's what really let the users kind of decide how big they wanted their imagination to be. And I think that's kind of something we've seen over the past 25, 30 years is just, you know, when the infrastructure gets a lot better, the users get super, super creative and get to do whatever they want to do. Totally. And I, I, I think back to, to uh, you know, asking my sister to get off the internet so I could use it. And, uh, and, and, and where we are now, and it, and, and it has been such an incredible pace of, uh, of development, but, but going back to that, you know, what, what are some of the most interesting parallels that you see between the development of web two and, and where we're at 
you know, in the development of where Web3, which I believe the last time I, I heard you kind of talking about where we're at in the development process, you were, I, I heard 1986. And then most recently, we're like, beginning of 90s to mid 90s. So we're, we're you know, yeah. where, where do you think we're at in that development? And, and what are those parallels you 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 you, uh, you think are interesting? Yeah, I think a lot of the parallel par- parallels are still lying at the, the infrastructure level. So, you know, beginning OG internet, it's a lot of like, you know, the router systems. And then after router systems came out, there was like a new technology called packet switching. And like this small company started it and it just, w- it was way faster. So, you know, Cisco basically went out and bought that company, acquired them in like 72 hours. <laughs> and then it's just like, okay, this is like a faster way to like network. And now I see the same thing happening with blockchains. I mean, we've we've had blockchains that have gone from proof of work, which, you know, Bitcoin as a payment system works wonderful. But if you're trying to layer in like the blockchain of Bitcoin proof of work into like a gaming protocol or a protocol that needs, you know, 10 to 20,000 transactions per second, it's just not going it, to it's not going to work. So now I think we're getting to that level where a lot of blockchains out there, they're they're innovating on the programming languages, they're innovating on what the smart contracts can do, building upgradable platforms that are just making things so much faster. I mean, to the point where, you know, some blockchains out there right now, obviously where I'm at at Aptos, like we're almost neck and neck with like a Web2 gaming platform as far as latency goes. Like you wouldn't really know the difference if you were on a blockchain or not. So I think that's that's where we're kind of going right now. And that's where I see a lot of the parallels. The infrastructure is is great. The other one I will touch on real quick is that, you know, even, you know, back in Web2 days, everything was like started out artists, musicians, DJs first, always. Like the one thing you could always find was like, where your latest band was playing on like a a chat board or like some kind of a message board. They loved artists, they loved DJs, like they loved the punk music. You could see that now we're doing the same thing. It's artists, musicians, people. Cultural trends. It starts with the culture. Always starts with the culture. the tech and tech follows. Mm -hmm. And then the tech follows where the culture is. And then, you know, unfortunately a lot of times the culture gets buried. So I think, you know, we're gonna fight real hard to make sure that that doesn't happen quite as bad. It's a little bit inevitable, unfortunately, but I think we can hold on to the culture a little bit better this t- this time around. Yeah, interesting. You brought up Aptos because you know Aptos is actually one of the one of the layer ones that that is is doing some really interesting things. You guys are using the the Move programming language, which is a Rust based programming language, and it and it it allows itself to be super nimble and and really allow you know for for the programmers that are utilizing it to to be. Um, yeah, well, to be nimble and flexible with their code. So, so as you said, it it it, it works so that you know the the speed at which your 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 latency is at is improved and improved and improved. The 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 more that you can add to the code, the more that you can be more immersive and interactive for your users. In, in terms of that that early experience, and and you know, same with Web three as Web two. It's it's a nascent technology where you know everyone that you talk to that isn't involved in the space is telling you this is not the future that a, a you know a blockchain is just a ledger uh you know h- how how does that you know how does that look in the future there, there is no future and when i when i when i think about that and then web 2 i go back to and i don't know if you remember paul krugman he uh and for those that at home that don't know paul krugman was a, a famous economist in the late 90s early 2000s and i i, I remember him uh I, I remember the famous quote where he said that he, he thought that the internet would be no more impactful than the fax machine. And, and every, everybody kind of was like, oh, that's an interesting take and, and okay, cool. We're hearing the same thing with Web3. You see all this development around you. You see, you, you see all the big players that are going from Web2 to Web3 and yet my mom and dad really do not believe it and they don't understand why I work here. And by the way, everything that I'm working on is gonna go to zero. How did building and operating within that environment specifically where everybody's telling you this is not the future help prepare you for your transition into Web3? Yeah, it's like you said, you hear the you hear the exact kind of uh, feedback all over again. It, it was the same, like kind of along that Paul Krugman line. I remember somebody saying they had more people went shopping at their local shopping mall than even had email addresses at one point, <laughs> like during a lunch hour. And I'm like, ah, that's really weird. OK, got that. Um, but even moving like further along, like even to the beginning of Instagram, like I at the time was working with a, a department store that's fairly well known and I couldn't get them to do Instagram for four years. And like 
every single one of those four years, they lost 50 to 75 million in market share, not to wow. other department stores, but to people that had small boutique stores that knew how to do internet ads and were making, you know, 1 million to 3 million in revenue a year. But there were like 50 of them taking market share from this particular department store. So finally they're like, yeah, well, I, we should probably be on Instagram. Like we, we don't understand it, but we should probably be there. And same thing over and over again, you know, 96 Pizza Hut fired up their website and all they did was collect email addresses and they couldn't do delivery. They didn't understand it at the time, but when, you know, e-commerce and them being able to deliver through an email system started to work, they had 380,000 emails in the Bay area alone that they were just like, well, now we're just going to kill it. And they did. So I think we're seeing the same thing now is there's always an advantage to being an early entrant into a new technology. Either you're going to learn really quickly or you're actually going to get market share on some pretty important people. And like, you know, Adam said, like culturally, the people that are typically in first are the cultural influencers. Like you don't influence somebody with a Super Bowl commercial. You influence people yeah. with like, you know, 50 people that a new generation looks up to being involved in a technology. And that's, I mean, we saw that in the internet. We saw that with social. We're seeing that in Web3. It's its a big lift. I think right now people are thinking that we're not going fast enough because the velocity of what we're hearing in our ear is just so, so fast. You know, like in Web1 internet, you know, inception days, it was, you know, every three months you go to like a local computer meetup and you hear about the new technologies. Well, you know, in social, it was like, yeah, your friends understand social and they might email you an invitation to join a new social network. Now we're hearing about Web3. There's probably, I would say, a million tweets a minute about Web3. So even though the technology is, wow. is moving quickly, yeah, it doesn't seem fast enough because mm. we're talking about it nonstop on social media, which is interesting that, on Web2. <laughs> that's, important, that's an important distinction right there. Why we're, well, talking, I tell people, why we're talking more about it because the technology is to enable us to talk faster about it. Well, I mean, from from HT, HTTP, HTTP protocol to the first browser was almost 11 years. So like, <laughs> we're, yeah, that, that's yeah. got, and it's like, it seemed like that happened fast, but looking back, that's over a decade it took that technology to happen. Facebook implemented their ad platform, what, it's been almost 15 years now? And it's like, it doesn't seem like it's been that long. And like, nope. same with Web3, it's like, Crypto Kitties was only 2017. It's only been five I know. years. I, and, and I can't believe that. We feel like we've been through this like World War Three of like market cycle and it we haven't even started. <laughs> yeah. First first step out of the first inning, in my opinion. We're yeah, starting that. Definitely. And and you know, to, to a lot of what you're talking about, it's it's that it's that factor that big brands, you know, growth among ab above everything else, where I think now is that time where you really need to slow down so that you can speed up. And, and there, I think actually we have a, we have a particular case where we can actually kind of discuss this, um, in terms of big brands that are entering web three. Um, you know, the, the, the first one I want to talk, you know, the first brand I'd like to talk about is actually doing it the right way. Um, you know, the, the, the artifact, the artifact and Nike collaboration. And, uh, and I will stop this real quick and say that, uh, uh, our recruitment consultancy, probably nothing talent. We we do support Artifact uh, in recruiting, so I, I will mention that. So I am a little biased, but they are killing it. So that's why I'm talking about them. But the Nike Artifact collaboration, they 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 cleared about 190 million dollars in NFTs last year. And how did they do that? By being community oriented, by immersing their their community in the lore, by by bringing them in and getting them involved, by slowing down to speed up. In my opinion. And then what's a what's what's a recent example of one that maybe could have took taken that that uh, that advice? Porsche. Porsche. Porsche could have done that. And so you know, I actually I heard you recently speaking. Uh, I, I forget where it was now, um, but but you were speaking with John Kraski, and uh, and uh, you guys had kind of NFT you know, heat. <laughs> it, it, I'm I'm not exactly sure. Oh, it was but, on the, uh, a LinkedIn audio that we did recently. Uh, yeah, yeah, a plug there you, for John. Yeah, there yeah. a plug for John. So, so, there you go, John. Plug you. But uh, you know, you guys dropped your thoughts, and 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 you brought something up that that plugged a chord for me, and it was like mind blowing. <sighs> honestly, um, it was your dealership strategy, right? So slow down to speed up. What does Porsche have? They're an automotive company. So what do they have? They have dealerships all across the country, 290 plus of them, right? 
So what does that give you the opportunity to do? You can, you can immerse peop, your most engaged people at all these dealerships in your lore. You can, and, and so what, what you mentioned as a strategy was, why not go to all these dealerships, look at your top five, top 10 um, owners, the ones that are engaged, that, that, are, you know, that, that are more likely to, to utilize the NFT that Porsche dropped and go to these go to these events and be immersed in the brand versus you know just just dropping 5000 to dgens like us who are just going to speculate on it you know think small think about the 100 people that are going to evangelize your brand and not the million brand, people that don't and you're care you're out to people that can't afford it i can't afford a porsche i don't need their, their nft <laughs> not even not even you can't afford a porsche we probably can't even afford to go to all these events that they have in monaco and all these places right well, so like like really thinking 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 smaller. So I'm curious in terms of the, the, the dichotomy between the two, have you seen any brands that have entered this space and, and are doing it right? Mixing that web two marketing strategy with web three, any campaigns that you've seen that have just been like, wow, I haven't seen a ton and I'll, I'll kind of go back real quick on something you touched on at the beginning with just the volume of, you know, over a hundred million in NFT sales. And I had this conversation yesterday with somebody, um, that, wants us to do a, a very large sports sponsorship. And, you know, the thing that they kind of pointed out to me was like, you know, NBA Top Shot is huge. And, you know, this is just such a massive market. And, yeah, you know, so I start looking at the numbers and it's, and this is where I think all of us that are in Web3 have the blinders on massively. And I'll give you two examples. That's NBA Top Shot, 562,000 unique wallets. That's not even the average... That's so, okay, so the average attendance of one NBA team, just their home games per season is 700,000. That's just one team, and that's just their home game. So 500,000 wallets, not a drop in the bucket for yep. the entire NBA or you know any other industry that's bigger than that as well. Second is I spoke with one of the lead investors that invested in Discord way back in the day and had a conversation with them about like, what are their thoughts on implementing, you know, Web3 tech into Discord? Are they going to do it? What are they thinking? And they said, you realize that Web3 users or NFT communities on Discord only represent 0.8% of our users. <laughs> They're like, if you know anybody that's going to change their product roadmap for less than 1% of their users, but what's the first thing we do when we talk about Web3 communities? Go make a Discord, go make a disc. There's literally nobody there. So like, or, or it's all the same. Isn't it all the same people, right? Like I just run into all the, the same people. It's the same 3 million ETH wallets that buy it's every just, single NFT. So like to your point about like Porsche, it's like, you know, dropping 7,000, 10,000 NFTs. That's great. That's literally only double the amount of people I went to high school with. So like, <laughs> let's like, perspective. like we really need to like think of the numbers here and the scale that we're talking about when we're thinking of like real consumers that are out there in the market. When you've got companies like, Roblox that are doing like 30 to 40 million daily active users and we're like can't even wow. get 7000 NFTs sold. It's yeah. like we're it's like Adam like you, you hit it like we're we're not even at our first at bat. No. We haven't even started. People that are doing it right, I will say like to artifact point is is leaning on the culture very heavily like they use a lot of that playbook that Supreme used to use um you know with scarcity and really bringing the culture into Premium. it. Mm -hmm. But what they're doing like in a really smart way is they're actually taking the feedback from the culture and using yep. it instead yep. of giving consumers their own idea of what the culture is. They're actually taking advice. And I think that's the big difference between, you know, the web three companies, or, or I should say the traditional companies that are doing good in web three and that aren't is they're actually listening to the people that want to buy those NFTs. Yeah. I think I, brand equity, right? I, I think a lot of these Web 2 brands think that they can just come to Web 3 with the equity they built in Web 2. And then we're all just going to be like, oh, cool, great. Let's buy everything from Nike. It doesn't and work like that. It does I'm going to tell you the, fu the funniest example. So a major brewing company, which we all know and love, Red, White, and Blue, came you know, to me, talked to me about <laughs> doing a an, an NFT drop You know, for, you know, they want to do a Super Bowl NFT drop. And the whole pitch was like, well, you, you need to pay for the IP rights because we're going to onboard so many people. Like uh, you don't so understand. Many. We're going to onboard all these people into getting these Web3 wallets. And I'll tell you what happened. They sent out an email to all the users they had in their loyalty program, which was like almost 4 million people. Sure. Not one bought an NFT. 
Not one. Not one. They, they have no idea what it is. Their audience they is not aligned yet. They, they don't know educated. how to sign up they, for a wallet. They don't know what a wallet is. It's mistrusting, right? Number one, click-through rate was terrible. Wallet rate was near zero. Like, wah, wah. I, I mean, we, we've always found it. And I said this on that LinkedIn audio. In the United States, like, wallet acquisition cost is right around $105 to $115 just to get someone to sign up for a wallet. That's before wow. they even buy the NFT. Wow. Interesting thing is in developing countries where Web3 actually matters to their livelihood, where, right. <laughs> where they need equitable banking, they will sign up for it for free because they know that they can have control of their own financial destiny. It's just developed countries, North America, wallet acquisition is expensive. The UX is terrible. Yeah, what you know, what I what I hear you discussing here, Charles, is the difficulties of actually participating in Web three. We're we're making it incredibly difficult, and you know, um, you're you're you are you are making me remember uh, Christmas twenty twenty two, and Christmas twenty twenty two, I was I was sitting around the dinner table with my twenty six year old sister, who you know, who's grown up with with exponential technology in her face and in her hand, um, you know. Mm -hmm. Whenever I hear about participation in Web3, I always hear my mom or my dad wouldn't participate. But I feel like that's like the lowest common denominator. Yeah, like, of course, my mom and dad wouldn't participate. They didn't grow up with a, with a mobile phone in their hand all the time, right? But my sister did. My sister did. So let me tell you, and I'm going to make this quick. We opened up MetaMask because I am getting a wallet in her hands and I have an NFT already picked out for her. We get to the first screen. We do the little sign up thing. Do, 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 little sign up. Okay. We get to the very next screen. I think we're in it for like seven minutes at this point, which is the which is the secret recovery phrase. And I'm like, hey, hey, boo, here's how this works. Here's what this is and why you need it. If you lose your account, there's a way to get your money back. You'll never lose your money. Okay, that's weird. Hey, don't worry. It's just like that alphanumeric thing that you put in your modem so that we make sure nobody goes on your internet. It's not that much bigger. Um, she's like, okay, that makes sense. So as I'm explaining this to her, she is she's bringing the mouse over to her word document and she double clicks it and 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 a, and a, and a word in a word screen pops up i'm like what what are you doing boo what are you what are you doing you can't you can't save this on the internet are you crazy and she's like why can't i save it on the internet well what do you do what did you do with yours and i'm not going to say what i did with mine i'll just say it's on a piece of paper but but she got up and she said if if i need to be jane bond to participate then I, i'm good what's the point right hmm. that's right so my question is, <laughs> yeah, what's the question, Kevin? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so my question is, how how can we immerse people in this space, get them to use a wallet, and they don't have to be James or Jane Bond to do so? So we're actually working on a, a solution for that, and maybe by the time this airs, it it may be out. But it has to do a lot with taking some some ideas from the gaming industry. Ga gamers are notorious for losing their password literally every five hours. So it's kind of the like multi sign on option. And then also they can have either like forgot my password, single click log on, which will, you know, go to one of their trusted devices. But again, beyond that, like beyond seed phrases, beyond all of that, what we really need to get to is mobile first wallets with biometric sign in. That's the only way we're going to it's the only way that that's going to work in the next three years. I think three to five years, you know, a, a consumer, oh, quantum computing con, consumer affordable quantum, you know, will be yep. available in any, any RSA typed password is basically it's pointless. You're not going to be able to, everything's going to have to be biometric within five years or you're pretty screwed. I think I saw that the supercomputer broke like every password ever created within like 10 minutes of trying. So yeah, the one there, there's one, right. And I'm, I mean, I don't think a lot of, I mean, I hope a lot of people are not going to go out and buy this, but basically one that can break every typewritten password right now is oh, it's wonderful. about between 70 and $80,000. So once that consumer cost comes down, yep. you, you could imagine. It, That's not even a lot of money for some of these. Shade yeah. It, it, if a government or a scumbag wanted to go buy that and break everyone's actually, password, not that it's tough. It's actually not a bad ROI on that, but that's a whole separate podcast. Yeah, pro Kevin. probably we'll, not. We'll, yeah. we'll table that one. Yeah. At least yeah, I'm not going to tell you who builds it. <laughs> no, nah, web shit right there. Yeah. And then just just kind of wrapping wrapping this thought up, um, you know, in, in terms of being early to a tech, right? So what we're talking about is being early to a technology, and and when you are, you you know, you deal with the trials and tribulations, uphill both ways in the snow. It, it's just going to kind of be like that. What do you what do you feel are the what do you feel are the advantages and disadvantages to being early, and and for you personally, 
how do you contain the FOMO that I, I think we all feel in this space as we're here or do you? Yeah. I mean, I, FOMO is just going to happen. And I've luckily <laughs> I'm old enough to know that I've missed a million great investments, a million great companies. I'm going to miss a million more. And it's just something that is going to have to be dealt with. Nobody can, when a technology this big is taking over the entire globe, like you will not get, you will not get to be a participant in every single piece of that technology. I think like that's one of my superpowers from seeing that before is that I've seen these patterns. And so I can kind of spot these patterns and like how these cycles actually go. I feel actually pretty sorry for the people that have not gone through these cycles before because the amount of people giving them that FUD and just like talking crap on the industry, like this is bad for you. It's not going to work. It's going to zero. It's, it's like, please understand, like I have heard this in three or four cycles now and it's never gone to zero and five years later they're already using the tech that they just said they hated so <laughs> don't worry about it but I, I do feel that you know a lot of younger participants in web3 are at a disadvantage only for the fact that they're hearing that kind of fud for the first time and that can be just a wreck on your psyche <laughs> yeah totally uh and and moving the conversation a, a bit forward here um i want to you know we, we kind of touched on web 2 and and you know your 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 uh, experience there how that translated into web 3 and then let's let's bring it to the metaverse prior to aptos you were uh, at land vault as their vp of strategy working with organizations that wanted to build in open metaverses and i believe the sandbox into central land correct me if i'm wrong yeah, those were right. the main two, but they, okay. they would explore all of them. Yeah. Awesome. You know, one thing about the metaverse and, and Web3 is, you know, I, I absolutely don't think it's a debate anymore in terms of the whole discussion we're having right now. We are absolutely on the cusp of the next evolution of the Internet. I don't care if anybody tells me it's going to zero. We are. But but I hear so many different definitions of what Web3 and the metaverse is and you know, I, I, for me personally, I find one to be just an extension of the other. And as I was doing my research and listening to you talk, um, I, I heard you describe it kind of the same way. And, and I'll, I'll just briefly, I, I have a note here as to what that was. You said the metaverse is the next version of the web. It's not an actual platform like Roblox or Sandbox, not interfaces like VR or mobile phone. It's a way to seamlessly interact between your real life and virtual life and express yourself equally in both ways. And then you mentioned Roblox and Fortnite as being two that, you know, that are building it out in that, that are, in terms of building it right, are building out their metaverse in the right way. That is exactly how I conceptualize it. You know, I, I don't foresee us, you know, forgetting about in real life experiences. We're not going to be grocery shopping in the metaverse. We're not going to be, we're not going to be doing these things that you need to do in real life in the metaverse. It's simply going to be extension and, and it's going to be a new technology that we allow to create better and more immersive and more interactive experiences but we are not living in the metaverse. And you said, and, and it sounds like you're in the same boat. You know, in, in your opinion, how do you see the metaverse shaping and impacting society over the next decade? And what role do you see it playing in our daily lives? Yeah, I think my, my short definition of the metaverse is the immersive continuum of the internet. And so that's just so, something that I, like I that. use I like as, that. you know, I think everybody has seen ready player one. They think it's a dystopian future of like, everyone's going to be sitting around in their, their house with, you know, VR goggles on running around in a circle. And that's just not going to be the case. You know, we'll see, and we have been seeing AR actually take off first. And that's kind of, you know, the first step into just a more immersive environment around you. Like to your point at the grocery store, yes, we, we're not going to go shopping at a virtual grocery store, but if I go and I find some produce that I like, am I going to be able to you know, run my phone over that in an AR filter and find out the sustainability of where that's traced back to if it actually is organic. Yeah, probably. But that's a more immersive version of the internet as well that actually helps you while you're grocery shopping. Um, I think, you know, the platforms like Fortnite, Roblox, Decentraland, one of the areas where we're lacking a little bit right now and what I think Web3 is all about is that user participation and that user ownership of assets. And I think any publicly traded company is really struggling with this because it, it does shrink the gap of, you know, where their, their profits actually are at the top line to, you know, it, it's going to shrink that. And, you know, but, and this is why I'm so hopeful for Gen Alpha, which is a, you know, a segment of the population that I always keep an eye on age you know, born after 2010, 
I watch their trends like very deeply because when it comes to publicly traded companies focused on profit, I will tell you if you know kids in this age range, they will not they will not stand for it. They will not take it. So like eventually we see a lot of these brands dabbling with Decentraland, dabbling with Sandbox to see how ownership actually works with their um, consumer base. Not because they think like, oh, this is going to take off right now, but they know if they don't do it now in 10 to 20 years, they're going to be out of business. AWS talks to Web3 companies all day long. Is it because Amazon thinks that you know, they need to go Web3 right now? No, but they know that in 20 years, when those kids that have grown up that don't accept the corporate world for what it is today speak with their wallets, they better be ready for that. So I think like you'll see a lot of big companies dabbling right now, not to make a million bucks today, but really just how to survive over the next two decades. I mean, that plays right into what we talk about all the time is, is slow down to speed up. I mean, it really goes into the ethos of everything. And, and the more I learn, and I'm learning through osmosis through incredible experts like you two. And the other group that I learn from are my two kids, my 10 year old daughter and my four and a half year old son that are experts in Roblox. And I look over their shoulder and I see what they're doing and it's native to them. My four and a half year old can navigate the whole world of Roblox at this point. And he's asking me to buy things and we're understanding what the, what the interface is and the engagement. You're spot on with that, Charles. Watch what Gen Alpha is doing right now. Goes back my, to what Gary, my, my, I mean, Gary Vee's been preaching that for a long time. He's like, watch the kids. When I, when I, this probably hit me the hardest was one of my buddies, Andrew, his kids having a birthday party. I, they're all around like eight years old, nine years old. They're all playing Roblox, like doing their thing. He got 200 Robux for his birthday. Like, obviously, like that's like winning the lottery, just losing. <laughs> so his excited. So okay, excited. So, yeah. so all these kids are just sitting there playing Roblox, and his dad's like, are we going to go do stuff for your birthday? We're going to, oh. and he's like, we're doing it, dad. This he's is like, the birthday party. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, all my friends are in here. Like they're socializing, they're chatting. They're all in there. Like, and they're talking, talking to each on, other. Yes. This is, this is the world we're living in right now. And like, so he's like, you lose, he's get like, with it or he's get like, out. What do, he's like, what do you mean? What am I going to do? He's like, we're doing it. We're buying things. We're spending my Robux. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this, I need right. to pay more attention to what these kids are doing because that's the right. consumer. People are like, there's no way anyone's buying shit on on any of these games. Oh yeah, go go look at sales for for skins and the and the, the weirdest crap that my kids buy on Roblox. But that makes them happy. Yeah, and it's you, customizable, you think, and they're owning their characters and they're loving it. They're I, personalizing. I can tell you that Target and Walmart wouldn't have Roblox and Fortnite gift cards at the checkout counter if they weren't selling. <laughs> and swag, they still have the swag. My kids have all the Roblox swag. Yeah, it's real life. But that's why that's why technology is so awesome, right? It's age agnostic. It's 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 prove it, right? It's just prove it. Learn it and prove it. That's why that's why I love it. And and going back to what you guys are talking about, I think the biggest risk for for brands is just simply not even trying. Um, you know, in mm. terms of of just giving it a shot, seeing what's out there, but but you know, be slow about it. I think I think they haven't cataloged what the last 15 to 17 years of, of what's been going on, right? Decentralized mm -hmm. trust. The reason why we're doing Web3 and all this sus all these things are decentralized trust, central authority, going back to, to Web2. For Web2, I'm not sure if you remember, for the last 15 years, you have been making us your product, right? And, and who's going to know that more than anybody? Young people. Young people, and you know, the younger generation understands this intently. Their whole lives, they've been a product online. Yeah. But, but in terms of what you guys were just saying, the future is so much more immersive. It's so much more personable, more interaction. It's community oriented, and and that's what I I really think that uh, you know a lot of a lot of these um a lot of these brands are missing. So, you know, do do you agree? Do do you think the biggest risks for brands right now? is just not not getting involved i think they're scared to take the risk because of the feedback that they're getting you know we, we've seen some brands enter the space enter you know doing metaverse builds unfortunately first thing they do when they call is like what's our potential roi how much money do you think we're going to make and right there the conversation's like okay like you need to put this in like an r d budget this is not going under your like marketing capex because yeah. this is not a marketing play you might get a PR headline, but like this is not a marketing play. You need to start understanding what these, you know, what these consumers are saying. And unfortunately, they they don't like to listen to it because what the consumer is saying is don't advertise to us as much. Don't push your product down our throat as much. Listen to the improvements we want. And that's all stuff that like major brands don't necessarily like to hear because that means change. And 
change for a big brand is just as hard as change for, you know, an individual person. Like it's uncomfortable. So like, I do think brands need to take the risk, but understand like you're going to go through a period of being uncomfortable and listening to this feedback. But yeah, I mean, like you said, like take the risk, get your learnings and, you know, build that institutional knowledge on what the space is, is doing. You're going to be way ahead of your competitors in the next, you know, three to five to 10 years. Yeah, totally. And you know, when, when, when I think about the brands that are, that are actually doing it at least somewhat right, you know, we were talking about some of them earlier. Um, you know, I, I think they're looking for ways to strengthen loyalty, you know, build a sense of community with their existing customers. And, and that reminds me of like what Starbucks and Polygon are doing with, with Odyssey mm-hmm. and their loyalty program. You know, um, second, they're, they're, looking, they're looking to connect with new customers and open up new streams of revenue. So that goes back to, to product feedback, listening to, to your customers, your new customers, the DGENs. You know, some of us that have been in this space, we're going to have a completely different want and, and need for this space. Mm-hmm. And, and I think Nike and Artifact and what they're doing, right? And then third, you know, exploring ways to reinvent some of the ways that, that you do business. Make it faster, make it cheaper, make it better, right? In, in your experience, you know, what are, what are some of the most effective strategies that big brands have used to navigate Web3 being the next, lev, you know, the next evolution of the internet? And, and then how do you see some of these strategies evolving into the future as these younger generation that has grown up with Roblox and Fortnite as they enter this space as adults? Yeah, right now I haven't seen a ton of successes from big brands and that's, you know, just a couple of reasons. One, there hasn't been enough time for these loyalty programs and CRM based programs to really play out. Like they're all just fairly new. Second to that is if they have a really ambitious idea for marketing or getting people on board, the technology of the actual blockchain is just not up to par. Like doing a Super Bowl commercial where you think 1.5 million people are going to scan a QR code in nope in you know a two minute period i mean even even the fastest of chains out there right even if you like scanned that and they ran it through the visa network it would probably break like it's just not (laughs) one of those things that like you can actually get on chain to do a transaction that fast i mean those are things like we're trying to solve and we're working on but like really ambitious really high transaction type stuff with mass consumers super difficult just with the existing tech um And then I think, you know, the long play is how do you get a lot of those customers? You know, Starbucks loyalty program is a a prime example of that. Like, I think it's a it's a great idea. But we go back to that idea of like how many people are running to do their mobile order for coffee are going to stop, get an NFT, get a non-custodial wallet. Like it's that just want my coffee. It's that my freaking coffee. It's that journey again where it's. You know, until it becomes super easy and seamless and in the background, like we work on technology right now where the wallet doesn't even show up. Like you just log, you, mm. you, you go on the website, you're automatically logged into your wallet. So like that's just stuff that like it, it needs to happen. People doing it right in the space. I mean, I think anybody testing like and yeah. we, we've had this talk with brands before, obviously, like when I was at Land Vault, we had technology where we could see, you know, all of the NFT ownership of all of the wallets that were connected to Decentraland and and do all that analysis. And I will tell you, it's the people that were, yeah, the, it, people say like, yeah, there's not a ton of people there. Yeah, there's not. But guess what? The average wallet size of people that were in Decentraland at the time had over $17,000 worth of NFTs. Like, oh, wow. How many like other times are you going to find cultural influencers with 17K that are two clicks away from them buying something? Not Not many other places. So, so it's like one of those, it's like, there's not a lot of people there, but they are pretty dang valuable people. Yeah. And, and we're interactive people and we really, really, really want this space to, to, to progress. Let me, Go let ahead, me Adam. have a question here, Charles, R- real quick, just a, a hot take. What do you think is the, the biggest threat right now to the Web3 ecosystem? I mean, I think the big, the biggest threat right now is it's it's going to be regulation. There are some chains and chains that are tied to tokens that are very much acting like securities, and that's a difficulty. The other thing is when you run into major Fine brands, line. I know that like it's where you come into secondary markets and regulation where you can have like a lot of issues. Like Artifact and Nike have done a good job at this. Before that deal happened and went down, I had talked to Nike just because of my relationship there. And one of their ideas was actually, you know, dropping NFTs for access to the latest sneakers and then creating that secondary market where you can 
buy, sell, trade, the access to be the first to buy that sneaker. Unfortunately, uh, if they created mm -hmm. that secondary market to sell access to a new sneaker, if they were to advertise that sneaker any time during that period, mm. they basically created an options contract that they're advertising for. So like there's just these wow. really weird like regulatory conditions. It's like we've seen with every regulatory entity. They're always two to three years behind. And then when they do, you know, implement regulation, it's typically very heavy handed because they don't understand the ecosystem. So they yep. just put a very broad brush stroke over the entire industry. So I think we still have to go through that period. Um, and I and I think there's going to be some some chains linked to some pretty popular tokens that are going to suffer pretty drastically for it. Yeah, you know, when you when you boil it down, I'd say probably 19 of the 20,000 are just kind of shitty software companies, right? Like, let's just keep it real. Um, they, they are absolutely securities. They operate yeah. and, and, and act like securities. And so, you know, to that end, that's why I don't I don't behoove Gary, Gary Gensler as much as as I really want to. You know, I, I don't behoove Congress. I want I want us to slow down to speed up as we've been talking about. I want these people to understand this space and technology, at least have people that are making these big decisions, at least have some people, you know, on the, on, you know, in, in a seat that understand, understand what Web3, understand why we're doing it. We're not, we're not honestly just a bunch of DGENs with, inter, you know, magic internet money. We're actually building something that, that we want to be sustainable. So, you know, to, to that point, I, I do hope that we're very deliberate about, about, um, about regulation. And I hope we, yeah, like you said, I hope it's not broad and heavy handed. And I, I'm really looking forward to the Hester Pierce's of the world. Um, and, and, and those folks that actually understand our space, having a say and a voice in there. I do, I do think there's a lot of times we don't help our own case though. And especially in the, in the, in the space of NFTs, especially, the PR and it's, side, yeah. you know, when you really look at some of the NFT purchases that have like access to a specific event when you've got people buying four yeah. and five of those okay well what are the extra four for i mean obviously yeah. like you're speculating in order to resell those so like that's where you know i just was looking at some tom brady nfts they they minted i believe they minted like 2500 of them oh wow but only 700 of there's only 700 owners so you know yeah. like all those people have like three each of and course. it's for like access to a broadcast or access to like his there, there's like a party in march in tampa bay you can go to and it's like like are you really inviting mm. three people or are you trying to speculate on like what the actual value of those are going to be in the future like the you know the lionel messi like um eternity had a, a drop of his the jerseys like 8500 uh 8500 were available for mint only 1200 got minted it's like a lot of these nfts are just like come on guys like it same old people doesn't find do the same yeah. NFTs. Make it that do are dropping them on us. <laughs> yeah, and so that's why I think like NFTs and that technology actually need to be used for rewards, access, ticketing, fan loyalty. I mean, there's a lot of incredible use cases for NFTs, and just buying, trading, and selling them are probably not even in my top ten. Just a, a quick note on that. I, I saw it done really well at, at Art Basel uh, Miami this year with NFTs used for ticketing the World of Women uh, Galaxy event was fantastic use of that. Uh, v Friends, their event at, at Scope Miami done through NFT ticketing done pretty well in my opinion. And it was it was something you sought after. The only way to gain access was through the NFT. So that's it. Kevin, bring us home here, man. Well, just just last question to really wrap all this up in terms of, you know, the threats that we face kind of, you know, we, we talked about it not really being just getting in and, and trying things out. What, you know, based on everything you've seen coming from Web 2 to Web 3 to the metaverse, what's your what's your hey, we have every brand in the world listening right now. What's your advice for them? <laughs> My biggest piece of advice is please separate the technology from cryptocurrency. That's always been the biggest hurdle that I've faced in dealing with these major brands is you start talking to them about blockchain and NFTs and what they can do. And they say, we can't handle Bitcoin. And you're just like, could they, could, they, they couldn't be, <clears throat> yes, they're loosely related in a technology space, but it's, it's just so far apart. So I think if every brand can like take the time to understand how different those two things actually are. Yeah, that would be super helpful. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying new things here.
Yeah, I always say that web, you know, web three is not crypto. Crypto are not NFTs. NFTs are not blockchain. Blockchain is not Bitcoin. And if you if you are lost in any of that, then then you really need to immerse yourself more in this space. And that's what these big brands got to do. So that 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 makes total sense. All right, we are getting close to the end of the show, and we are moving to a segment we like to call the lightning round. Charles, Love we're going to give you two. Op- we're going to give you two options. You have to pick one or the other. And if you choose neither, then you must promise to us that mm-hmm. you will take a shot of something strong right after this show. <laughs> Whew, nine in the morning. Work. So I'm going to pick one or the other. Perfect. All right. And I'm going to make this hard on you. Here we go. Go for it. Kobe or Michael? Uh, Michael. Oh. Nike or Adidas? Nike. Crypto Kitty or Crypto Punk? Punk. <laughs> Ethereum or Solana? Okay, this is going to be the toughest one. I'm going to go Solana. Yes. Hmm. Good choice. NFT NYC or NFT Miami? Oh, Miami. All day. <laughs> Web 2 or Web 3? Web 3. Got to be. There we go, Come baby. On. There we go, baby. NBA Jam or NBA Street? Whew, NBA Jam. That's I grew yes. up on Old that. School. That's... Come on. He's heating up. Boom shock. He's on fire. <laughs> He's all fired. Yo, those those Classic. those flaming nets, they have to bring those back, please. Bring those oh, back. Oh, yeah. Nets. Life. Yeah. Okay. So I actually I actually own NBA Jam.eth, by the way, which is like Oh really? Man. That was one of the first ENS names I bought. You snagged that. Hey, we need to talk after the show. <laughs> um chat GPT or still your own brain. Hmm. I'm going chat GPT only because it will save me a lot of time for pretty mundane stuff. I mean, my brain works good, but not for the stuff that that, that can do. I, I'm, t- I'm, team, I'm, I'm team human, but I'm way more about team time saving right now. Um, I'm right there with you. Team human, but team efficiency. I'm right there with you. All right. Last two. Snapback or fitted? Oh, I'm snapback. <sighs> nice. And then the last one, I think I have an idea of where you're going with this. Philly or Kansas City? I'm going Philly. Yes. Oh, boo. Boo. You have an you have a New York Giants fan and a Cowboys fan. Sorry. Nah. I, I'm a Giants Miami, fan. Miami. So, and but yeah. the only reason I'm going for Philly is like I did not. I, I was a I'm a big Joe Burrow fan. I yeah, me too. And I, I do, <laughs> the NFL leans very heavily on Patrick Mahomes' success. Oh gosh, yes. And uh, I. I I'm not really there. That. So now, so now I got to the point where I just want Philly to absolutely savage KC. Hmm. Ooh, I, th- I think you're going to get what you wish for because I think Philly's going to annihilate them, in my opinion. But Jalen yeah, Hurts is a beast, man. That guy is he is a mu- And that defense is no joke. Yeah. All right. The last segment of the show. Speaking so, of jokes. So to end our show, I started the way I begin my day. And I've been beginning my day for the last two months by asking Chat GPT for its best joke. And eight times out of 10, I end up laughing. They are interesting, but I laugh. So we're going to end our show with a joke. I'm going to give you the prompt I, I chose, and then I'll, I'll tell you the joke. Here we go. Here was the prompt. I said, okay, pretend you have the best performing Web3 podcasts in the world, and your guest is Charles Atkins of Polygon. Remember, that his data is from 2021, guys, so I had to use something that they would understand. Now tell him your funniest joke. Here was the joke. Charles, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here today. I heard that you're the VP of NFTs for Polygon and have been revolutionizing the world of NFTs and blockchain technology. But you know what they say, Charles. It's not the size of the blockchain. It's how you use it. Wink. It's pretty good. It's pretty that, good. That, was, that, that was decent. That was decent. This is decent. Yeah. They, they yeah. tried. All right. Ask GPT if they heard about the fight at the seafood restaurant. Oh, no. I heard a lot of fish got battered. Oh, God. <laughs> it's really dad. Where's the drums? Really Where's the drums? If you really, if you, if you oh, that's really from, I'm sorry. That, that's that's from. There we dad, go. That, I missed my from, cue. That's from Dad GPT. Wrong, wrong. Dad, program. Dad GPT. Sorry, guys. We uh, we're, we we only have a few open spots for that, and it's all three of us. So sorry, you're not getting access. Apologies, guys. Apologies. <laughs> Charles, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you, Adam. 
Bring us home on the TLDR from our chat with Charles. Yeah, it's some real quick ones here. Um, talking about the history lesson here, Web 2 was really a hope for the faster internet. People were interested in speed, which led to imagination. Uh, and it all starts with any revolution really starts with the culture, where the artists, where the bands, followed by the tech. Uh, interesting chat around uh, in Instagram at, uh, adoption. You were talking about how large retail was kind of hesitant to, and that's where real small business jumped in and took advantage of it. Really first mover advantage. And the theme throughout the show has really been slow down to speed up. Absolutely love it. Um, Web2, this was an interesting one, Charles. Web2 uh, wallet um, cost per act per, per wallet, which was something brand new to me, which really lit the, the light in my head around 115 to 150 uh, per customer. I think that's really important for brands to understand. Um, mobile first biometrics and passwords, the way of the future, and it has to happen in the next five years. The FOMO is still real, even with someone like Charles. But his superpower is pattern recognition, really understanding uh, the cycles and putting them all into context. As far as the metaverse extension of real life, put that into context. We're not going to be ready to player one, everyone with their freaking headsets on. Um, I don't even want to talk about uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the long-term ROI um, from companies really listening to customers. Slow down, speed up, listen to your customers. Starbucks, it's a test and learn. They, they may be, you know, failing here and there, but at least they're doing it. They're getting it out there and they're trying it. And last but not least, Charles Pick is on Philly for the Super Bowl. By the time the show airs, the Super Bowl will be over. We'll know who the winner is and we'll figure it out. Charles, thank you so much for joining us here. We appreciate you. Where could folks find you? Where could they connect with you? Where could they learn more? Yeah, thank you both for having me on. LinkedIn's probably the best place. You can just search Charles Adkins. I'll probably be the first one that pops up. Um, on Twitter, don't use it as much, but uh, yeah, LinkedIn's probably the best place to find me. Good stuff. Awesome. Kevin, wrap us up here. And to everyone listening at home, I sincerely and greatly appreciate you for joining us on the Immutable Mindset. Please follow us on all our social media channels at Immutable Mind, at, excuse me, at Immutable Show. Subscribe, comment, and network. Remember, thanks for joining us. Catch us next week for more and take care.